talking about the principles of the spirit. Now, why are these principles critical for you to understand? Well, what is it that makes you different as a pastor or a Christian counselor than the secular counselor? Because you're operating in the spirit realm where they're not. And so understanding this kind of stuff is absolutely critical because the spirit is how you're going to help people that a secular counselor isn't going to be able to help those same people, right? So if you don't understand this, and we'll be dealing with some basics and some advanced things as we look at the different issues here of dealing with the spirit. And obviously I can't cover everything in the book and every line in the book. I'm going to hit the ones I think are the most important and emphasize that and try to integrate some of this for you. But we have quite a few topics to talk about here to understand these are the basics, though, of spiritual life. And you can use all these basics of spiritual life to help your clients. The first thing is, what in the world is a spirit? Well, I'm going to try and give you an intuitive feeling here that we usually don't get. And you might not totally like this just because we have a sort of our concepts of what that all is. But what's the spirit of a football team? Ever hear this football team has spirit? What does that mean? They got evil spirits in them? Now, it means there's something about that team that they're working together in unity, and that's a principle of the spirit. That the more you're in unity, the more you're dealing in a spiritual realm. Some football teams have a they're losing spirit. What is that like? They just all have faith that what? They're going to get creamed on the football field. And the same thing, how about a team that has a winning spirit? So do you see, spirits are something very deep. They're lower than even our attitudes. There's something that is just sort of there, and you know it. You've experienced spirits in your life all the time because you just walk into a room and you can pick up the spirit in that room, can't you? Remember one time that we were traveling, and we were traveling in a motor home, and we were traveling to California, and we went through Reno, Nevada. And the only place that had a motorhome place that we could stay was at the MGM uh, casino. And of course they have good cheap food there, right? But you know how it's set up. To get to the place to eat, you have to walk across the gaming floor. And you could cut the spirit of greed with a knife. I mean, it was so strong. It, it, you could just, it was there. I mean, it just dominated that entire place. Well, how did that spirit get there to take over that area? They all had a lot of faith in greed, didn't they? And they all had unity that everyone was going to rip everybody else off. And they were all going to make all these millions, right? And so they had that spirit. And so spirits influence our will. Now, how do spirits come into us? Through faith. If you don't believe in them, they're really not going to affect you very much. Why is it that we do not see very many miracles here in America in the way of faith healing? Because we tend to have more faith in our doctors than we have in the Spirit of God. At one particular church, I used to do the video ministry, and the pastor went to Africa. And he came back with all these videos of Africa, of, in Africa, of all these miracles. And it was so many, we got sick of seeing all the miracles. Because we had like eight hours of tape, we had to cut down to like half an hour. And just had to look at all these and pick all the better miracles. Now why? People in Africa believe in spirits. Evil spirits. As well as good spirits. So they believe in the spirit world. That, so they have faith. So therefore, spirits operate much more powerfully there than they operate here. What happens inside of us when we get saved, and how do we get saved? When you get saved, you invite the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, to come inside of you, right? 
How do you do that? Through faith. You simply believe in them and you allow that spirit to have influence. How much influence does a spirit have inside of you? To the degree you give it, to the degree you yield to it, that's the degree it can help you. So what degree can God help you? To what degree can God transform you? Only to the degree you believe in the spirit and the power of God and to the degree you're willing to yield your will to that spirit to allow it to operate in you. So what does it take to be saved? Most of you already know Romans 10.9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised it from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let's look at those. There are three things there. The first one is, do you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died on the cross and rose again? If you don't believe that, you have no basis of your faith and no basis of relying on God to do anything in your life, right? Because if he was not God, if he did not die for you, you're still in your sins and you're no better off than an unbeliever, right? Secondly, it says there you have to confess him. What does that mean? No secret service Christians. You have to openly confess as an allegiance. You're saying, God, I'm trusting you and I'm relying on you. And the third thing is, and this is the hardest one for most of us, it says you have to confess him to be Lord. What does that mean? He is in charge. Why does he have to be in charge? Because if he's not in charge, he won't do what he says. Can he help you? You're running across the parking lot. You say, stop, a Mack truck's going to hit you. And you keep running. You get run over by the Mack truck. You still have a will even when you get saved. So God can only help you to the degree you trust in him, you believe in him. And he's only going to be able to take over your life to that degree. Think of a spirit of lust. You get somebody, then they have a spirit of lust. How are they going to act? Probably get an internet pornography. Probably go to adult bookstores. And when they're there, what's going to happen? What kind of spirits are they going to find? More lustful spirits, and the more they do it, the more they yield to it, the more the spirits are going to take control, right? I'll give you an example of how powerful that can be. It's a true story, unfortunately. But there were three young men, and they were delving into the occult. And in the occult, the idea is you get power when you kill things, you get their power. So they were stealing people's pets and taking them out into the woods with baseball bats and killing them and throwing them in this well. What do you think is going on in the spirit world? See, the more they give into that and the more they do that and the more they believe that, the more they're going to have a desire to do more, aren't they? Because the Spirit's going to take over more and more and more. And one day they picked up the third boy and they headed out and they said, where are the animals? Oh, don't worry about it. That day they beat him to death and threw him in the well. Another story, a young man who got involved in the occult again, in the spirit world, and he kept getting into it deeper and deeper and deeper, yielding more and more to the Spirit, right? And he eventually convinced one of his friends to tape his hands and legs so he could push himself out in the lake and drown himself. Because the devil had convinced him that if he would kill himself, he would come back at the head of six legions of demons. And that's what he desired in his life. Do you see how they take over? I know I'm talking negative, but to see the same thing, the Holy Spirit wants to take over in your life more and more and more and transform you more into the image of Jesus Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, right? Because it was the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that Jesus had as he walked here on the face of the earth. Salvation is a gift of God that he gives to us based solely on unmerited favor for us. 
and not due to anything we have done. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What's that telling us? We couldn't save ourselves. We were selfish. We were running our own show. We were consumed by the flesh. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't make anything work. You can't do anything. It's all based on what Jesus did, right? There is no other way to escape our selfish and sinful life except through the process of salvation by faith. See, the word salvation is sozo, and it means to be made completely whole. This isn't just going to heaven. This isn't just fire insurance. This is a process that God uses to transform you from wherever you are in life to a whole, complete person, similar to that of Jesus Christ. And it's a process, and there is no other process that works like this. I'm sorry, but in secular counseling, all they can do is make the rat run faster. Unless your client is saved, there's a great limitation of how much you can do to help them. Period. And most of the spiritual process we're talking about today, you're not going to be able to use to help that person. We have a part in the salvation process. What is it? Yield. It is not try harder. We're going to find out by the end of this lecture that trying harder is not the answer. In fact, relying on yourself is not the answer. In fact, you can't transform yourself by relying on yourself. God is the one that is going to have to do it. So it's not try harder, it's yield more. It's die more to your flesh, it's die more to yourself and let God take over your life more and more. That's how this whole process works. Now, do any of us ever struggle against that? Anyone ever have sort of a problem wanting to be your own God and run your own show and do your own thing? Have you noticed that a little bit? That's the battle between the flesh and the spirit that is taking place. It's God's will that everyone be saved and be made completely whole. 1 Timothy 2.4 Who will that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? Think of a parent. You parents here. Uh, what do you want for your kids? That they be a drunk on cocaine and a male prostitute, right? Is that what you want? Well, what do you think God wants? If then God who's even better than us, what does he want for his kids? And every kid work through all these issues, work through everything, get the help they need, get transformed to the image of Jesus Christ, be a whole and complete person. And God's method is through the Spirit. How do you know that you're even saved? You can get people coming in all the time. I'm not sure I'm saved. Well, you can ask them the diagnostic questions, right? Well, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven? And uh, if you're standing at the gates of heaven and God asks you why should he let you in, what would you say? Those will help a little bit, but here's another clue. What is the key thing that changes, even if the person is still a baby Christian or a carnal Christian, inside of them that would indicate that the Spirit of God is inside them? What is that? They want to do what's right. There's a little story that I like very much. It's a, about a young lady who was trying to join a church back in the days when they wouldn't let anyone join unless you could prove that you were saved. And so the elders were questioning her, and the elders said, before you were saved, did you sin? I said, oh yes. And they said, well, now that you're saved, do you sin? I said, yes. Well, then how do you know you're saved? I said, well, the way I know I'm saved is before I was saved, I chased after sin. Now that I'm saved, I run away from it, but sometimes it still catches me. Do you see the difference? It's the Spirit of God is there, but you can still be a very carnal person and be a Christian because you're not yielding to the Spirit of God. You're still trying to run your life. You're still trying to do your own thing. And God can't help you more than you will yield to Him, and He can't transform you more than you will yield to Him.
The next thing we're going to talk about is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, there might be some of you that don't even believe in that. And that's your choice, but everyone be fully convinced in your own mind. And there are a bunch of confusion here that I want to straighten out for you for a little bit. Some of the confusion is, well, when you get saved, didn't I just say that the Spirit of God comes inside of you? Then what's the difference? Don't you get all of Jesus? That's the argument. And the truth is, yes, Jesus comes inside of you, but when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's allowing His Spirit to take control of your spirit. And that gives you a lot more spiritual power when his spirit now is dominating your spirit on the inside. And let's see it clearly in the scriptures that there are two different situations here. John 20, 22. And when he had said this, now this is after Jesus rose from the dead, but he had not gone into heaven yet. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So what did they receive? The Holy Ghost. If he did that, could we agree they received it? But Pentecost hasn't occurred yet, has it? So therefore they have the Holy Spirit inside of them, but something further is going to happen. And then in Acts 2.4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Jesus had predicted that they would be filled with the Spirit at some time forth, and that would give them the power to go out and minister effectively in the world. So that's what that's talking about. But can we show that conclusively in the scriptures? Let's take a look. Let's look at a little story here in Acts 8.12. What's happening here is Philip was going out and preaching. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. In the early church, when you're baptized, what does that mean? You're saved. How many churches do you know that baptize unsaved people? So are these people saved? Do you agree? Okay, now let's go down to verse 16. For as yet, he, the Holy Spirit, was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid there their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. See, some of these terms, especially the way they're translated, make it a little bit confusing in what's going on here, doesn't it? We have another example of that, exactly the same thing. That the Apostle Paul found some people that had known Apollos, and that he prayed for them, and then they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We also have the case of Cornelius. At that particular time, they actually received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time they got saved. So it can happen both ways, can't it? Another argument here has to do with the whole argument concerning speaking in tongues. We have no example in the Bible in which they did not speak in tongues. But let's look at that because we have some more confusion in the church again. What do people say about this? Well, doesn't it say in the Bible that if you speak in tongues, it must be interpreted? Well, then you shouldn't be speaking in tongues. See, what the Bible tells us is there are two things here. First, we have what we call the prayer language. That's what you receive with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the second thing we have are the gifts of the Spirit called speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And to understand that, we need to go to 1 Corinthians 14.2. Now, what do we know about the Bible as it was originally written? In your King James, they don't show you the paragraphs. What does a paragraph change mean? A subject change, right? So let's read a little bit here. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. And he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So what is this that we're talking about here? A language in which you speak to God. It's a prayer language, right? And it says you don't speak unto men, right? Can we all agree also the Bible doesn't contradict itself? We agree with that? 
Now jump down to verse 6. New paragraph. Chain subject. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues. I thought he said you don't speak to people. And before he said you speak only to God and you don't speak to people. Now he's speaking to people. What shall it profit you except I shall speak to you, again speaking to people, either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? In verse 13, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So what is the topic? Someone that is operating in one of the gifts of the Spirit. And what are those for? God gives you a message and you bring it to the body for them. This isn't a prayer language. Do you see the difference? Okay? And that needs to be interpreted. Why? Does everybody have the gift of interpretation? No. So how about all the people sitting around here that don't know what the heck you said? It'd be nice if it was interpreted in their language so they could understand it since it's a message from God for them. But does the prayer language have to be interpreted? I think God can probably interpret it okay. What do you think? I think that maybe he does understand what's going on. So we have all this confusion that's going on primarily with people that haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So how do you receive it? Well, we're talking about spirits. So what's it going to be? By faith. You receive it just like you receive it any other way. Why do some people have a struggle receiving it? Because they've been told, don't believe in it. If you don't believe in it, are you going to receive it? If you have no faith, are you going to be saved? Absolutely not. And I suggest if you haven't checked that out, you do, because this is a very powerful thing that you can use in counseling to help people that haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But from another one of our courses, remember something. In the course Transformation, we saw that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was crossing the Jordan River and God allowed two and a half tribes of the nation of Israel to remain on the opposite side of the Jordan River. Saying what? This isn't something that you shove on people that they have to have, but if you can, you can help people dramatically and sometimes get a major change in their life, in their experience. Because what happens to the person? My own experience, when uh, before I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I could give you good essays as to why God was real and why God had to exist. When I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I knew that I knew that I knew that God was real. What had happened? The revelation had gotten from my head to my spirit. Now there was no question whatsoever. It was experiential. And the same thing with people. When people receive that kind of power and know what it's like, that can make a major, major change in their life and a major change if they're struggling with the flesh. Because now we have a lot more power here, right? And of course, that also opens the way, although all the gifts of the Spirit were throughout the Bible except for tongues, tongues and interpretation, it tends to open people up more to operate in the spiritual gifts, in the supernatural gifts, because of the extra power that they have now in their spirit being totally immersed. It's called baptism, right? What does baptism mean? To be immersed. Your spirit is now immersed in the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God has all that power of now available to your spirit in what is going on in your life. How about prayer? Most of you know about prayer and most have been praying, but again, we have some controversies we need to address. Why is prayer so critical? Because it's our relationship with God that this is all about, right? It's the way you communicate with Him. How many of you know somebody that you've never communicated with that you have a good relationship with? And how do you know them? And how much can you trust somebody that you've never communicated with? You don't. So this is all building faith in building your life in working it through. And it's experiential. When you pray and you get answers, what does that tell you? God's real. It really happens. He hears you. We're not just playing games here, making up something in our minds. Now the problem is, how many of you ever struggled in prayer to get answers to your prayers? A lot of us, I don't think, really apply ourselves to an adequate level that we need to. But see, 
What's another reason for prayer? You're learning to rely on God instead of relying on yourself. How many people running their own life have a good prayer life? Tend not to do that, right? Let's talk about something about the will of God. When you pray, if you pray, Lord, uh, I'd really like this, but it's according to your will. What does that tend to do to your faith? I don't know if I'm going to get it or I'm not going to get it, right? So a better approach is this. Seek God, find out what his will is, and when you know that what his will is, then you can pray in confidence, right? And then you can pray in faith to see that thing happen. Another one of these battles that goes on is people will say, well, you pray once, never pray again, because if you pray again, you prayed in unbelief the first time, right? Well, is that true? Yes, it is, to a certain degree. It's true that if you pray the first time and you had faith for it, it's going to happen, right? Now, what am I talking about faith? I'm not talking about in your head. I'm not talking about in your emotions. I'm not talking about in your will. I'm talking about your spirit. You know that you know that you know. How many of us always know when we start praying? You don't. This is what they used to call praying through. Okay, praying through means what? I'm going to pray about something and talk to God about something till I know in my spirit that it's going to happen. And once you do that, then praise him and thank him and worship him for the answer because you know you've got it. If you keep praying after you know it in your spirit, what are you saying? I don't really know it in my spirit. I don't really know this. So in faith, you pray until you know it and then you thank God for it until it manifests, until you see it. So do you see both of them right? If you pray the first time and you know it in your spirit, you got it, don't pray again. Just thank God for it until you see it. See what I'm saying? But when you're praying, you don't know it in your spirit, isn't I know that I know that I know this is going to happen. Then keep praying, keep gathering evidence to support, build your faith until you know that you know that you know that it's going to happen. Do you see what I'm saying? In the controversy there, they're both right if you understand what's really going on there. All prayers are not immediately answered. How do we know that? We have the example in Daniel, don't we? Daniel 10, 12. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, from, from the first day, and we've been praying 21 days, from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy word was heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me a one in twenty days. But, lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. He's saying what? Even after you have faith, there is a battle in the heavenlies until that thing manifests itself and you see it in the physical world. And what do you need to be doing during that time period? Believing, thanking God, expecting it to happen until this thing manifests in your life. What's some other reasons that maybe prayers aren't answered? Well, selfishness. Think if you're a parent and your kid asks you for A M30 machine gun. Do you think you would give it to him? Probably not, because one, it'd be illegal, and two, is he capable of using this in an effective and good way? So God is a good God, and he's going to do what's best for you. And for some reason, he seems to think he knows what that is. But I want to read you a couple of quotes here on the area of prayer. This is from Reverend Hodges. This is what he says. No one can command success and become a real praying soul unless intense application is the price. I am even now convinced that the difference between saints like Wesley, Fletcher, Edwards, Brainerd, Bramwell, and ourselves is energy, 
perseverance, and an invincible determination to succeed or die in the attempt. It comes from uh, uh, E.M. Bounds. We announce the law of prayer as follows. A Christian's prayer is a joint agreement of the will, the mind, the emotions, the conscience, the intellect. What's that? Your mind, your emotions, will, all of you, that jury, that faith, remember we're talking about here? Working in harmony at white heat. The body cooperates under certain conditions to make the prayer long enough and at high enough voltage to ensure tremendous supernatural and unearthly results. This prayer thing is a pretty complicated thing, but the point of the thing is, spiritually you get a hold of the Spirit and you operate in that it is powerful, it can override anything, it can do anything. But it's going to be based on the degree you really believe in it. How about thanksgiving, praise, and worship? How do they fit into this whole picture? They're tools that God uses. Think of it this way. In a relationship, everything that you would do to improve a relationship with somebody else works with God. And everything that works with God works with other people. If you want to really get sort of on the good side of somebody, what do you do? Thank them for what they do for you. Tell them how great and wonderful they are. I'm not exactly saying worship them, but if they're God, that's okay. Though I did have a client that worshipped his wife. So what are we saying? Why do we have praise and worship in our services? Because it's the way to enter into the presence of God. Now, we have a whole model in the Bible we're not going to have time to go into here today, and that's the model of the tabernacle. And what does the model of the tabernacle look like? Well, we have an outer court, then we go to an inner court, then we go to the holy place, then we go to the holy of holies. And what's in the holy of holies? The Ark of the Testament, the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God. And that is a picture of us coming into the presence of God, into the manifested presence of God. And how do we do that? Psalms 104. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. The gates and the courts there are talking about coming into that tabernacle of getting close to God. Psalms 22, 3. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So what happens when we get and we move into that realm? And by the way, what's the difference? We have thanksgiving. How is that? That's thanking somebody for what they did. How is praise different? Praise is where you're saying things about them. You're wonderful, you're beautiful, permanent characteristics. How is worship different? Worship is adoration. They are wonderful, they are great, they're beyond description. And so those are sort of levels that we move as we get closer to God. And that verse just said what? God manifests himself in that. So if you want to come into the presence of God, why would we want to come into the presence of God? So we have that real relationship so we can feel him, so we can connect, right? Well, this is a method of connecting with God to getting closer to him and building that greater and greater relationship. And of course, the Bible says we must worship in spirit and truth. How about fasting? What role does fasting play in this? Why would anyone want to fast? I mean, not eat. I mean, in fact, in fasting, we have three different levels. We have first, you might fast where you don't eat anything, but you still drink water. Then we have an absolute fast where you don't eat or drink. And then we have a partial fast where you might just not eat desserts or you might just not eat the certain things that you like. But why would a person do anything like that? Because we got something called the flesh, right? And what does the flesh want to do? Be in control. Does the flesh want to eat? You bet. So what are you doing by fasting? 
You're putting the flesh down, and when you do that, when you deny yourself, you strengthen the spirit. So we fast to get spiritual power. We fast to hear from God. We fast to see answers to our prayers. We do all of those kind of things, but fasting makes it even stronger and makes it much more powerful. Isaiah 58. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loosen the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? So when you're dealing especially with spiritual oppression and all of these kind of issues, this is a strong tool to use. Very interesting. The Bible doesn't say if you fast. It says when you fast. What does that say? If you're looking for spiritual power, fasting is a good way to put your flesh down and to gain that additional spiritual power and that oomph in your life to see something happen. Principles of Revelation. I said we got to go pretty fast here because we got a lot of stuff to cover. Blackaby, in his book, Experiencing God and Knowing and Doing the Will of God, states that if a Christian cannot hear from God, his Christian experience is in trouble at the most fundamental level. What is the first thing that stops you from hearing from God? Being your own guy, doing your own thing, not really wanting to listen. Does God talk to people who don't want to listen? I tell you, in my life, as long as I was running my life, I never heard from God once. He just said, I'll watch, hit the concrete wall a couple more times. Maybe you'll get the idea. And so the first thing that will stop you from hearing from God is that you really don't want him to be in charge of your life or you're afraid he's going to say something you don't like and you're not going to be willing to do it. Of course, God speaks through a lot of different ways, doesn't he? Visions, prophets, the church, uh, the still small voice, your intuition, through the peace of God. One of the most powerful things in hearing from God is just knowing the peace about it, that that's right. Here's a rule. Don't do anything you don't have peace about. Because you're possibly going in a wrong direction. How do we learn to hear the voice of God? Relationship, relationship, relationship. How do you learn to hear your mate's voice? Relationship, relationship, relationship. You get to know what it sounds like, you get to know what it's like, and you can then learn, and you need to learn. The difference between hearing the voice of God, hearing your own thinking, and hearing the voice of Satan. And the Bible tells us how you do that. It says that it's done through learning the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In other words, it will divide your soul, which is what? Your mind, your emotions, and will, and your spirit, where God speaks to you, and separate those so you can tell the difference one from another. But this is something that experientially needs to happen and it's a spiritual experience that you need to have or you're going to have a lot of confusion going on as to whether this is you or whether this is God talking to you. In counseling, probably one of the most things that I use, we're talking about a method here, uh, you have in your book there, I have a particular method that comes from George Mueller and uh, Bob Mumford and myself. And it's a six-step method of hearing from God. We're not going to have time to go into that, but I just want to mention that to you. And basically, what does it take? First thing is you got to get to the place where you don't mind what God's answer is. Because if you want it to go one way or another, you're going to lie to yourself, you're going to con yourself some way. And you have to convince yourself, you know, God knows a little bit more than I do. You know, I don't know the future, so I don't know how this is going to turn out. So God, whatever you want. Then what they call the three harbor lights. The Bible, hearing from the Spirit, and circumstances. If those three things do not line up, don't do it. Because that's not God speaking to you. Once you have that, 
You say, God, if I'm wrong, I believe this is what you're telling me to do. If I'm wrong, blow it up. I don't want to do it. And then you wait for three days, if you can wait that long. And if you still have the peace of God about it, do it. And you'll find that'll be a very effective way. Uh, George Mueller stated that when he did this method, he never missed God once in his lifetime. But there are methods you can teach concrete things in counseling to help people get a hold of God. And of course, you take whatever situation they have, you apply this and you help them hear from God. And of course, they have to make the decision and to understand what God is calling them to do. You can read more in your book about that particular thing. Principles of conscience. Your conscience is part of your spirit. What's its job? To convict you if you're doing something wrong. But can your conscience be messed up? Can it be defiled or seared? See, defiled is getting the wrong information in there and accepting that in your subconscious mind. That's what defiles your conscience. Searing your conscience means you know God told you to do something and you refuse to do it. And you can live in sin and lie to yourself and put your conscience down to the point you don't even hear it anymore. So in counseling, what do we have to do sometimes? We have to help a person renew their conscience. The Bible calls it washing with the word. Get the truth in there. Help them understand what right and wrong really is again and to accept that. But if you don't want to, listen to your conscience. God won't force you. You can even go so far as what the Bible calls a reprobate mind. When you get to the place that you're so set and doing your own thing, God just says, okay, whatever you want to do, go do it. But of course, you get the consequences from that. The last thing we need to talk about is walking according to the Spirit. And this is probably the most important topic that we can possibly talk about. Why is this so important? Because this is the key to the entire New Covenant, to the entire New Testament, to everything, is learning to let that Spirit of God that we talked about inside of you take control of you and run your life. Ezekiel 36, 27 says, And I will put my Spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statues, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So how is it that we're going to get transformed here? Only by the power of the Spirit of God taking over. And what's that going to take? First faith, right? What else is it going to take? Yielding. What else is it going to take? Relying on Him to do it instead of you to do it. See, walking in the Spirit is, I concentrate on the things of God. I listen to God and I do what He tells me. And I rely on God to do it. And it's a whole different new way of life that you're going to have to learn. I remember as a new Christian, I would take like a whole Saturday and I would just say, okay, God, I'm giving this day to you. And I just want to listen to your spirit and whatever you tell me to do, I will do. And I get out my Bible and my song books and all the other kind of stuff and so on and just try to follow the spirit for that period of time. Well, God wants more than that. He wants you to follow the Spirit and walk in the Spirit all the time. Now why? Because this is how you're going to win the battle over the flesh. If you look at everything in the flesh and all the works of the flesh and you compare them to all the works of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, guess what? They're all opposites. So the way you win this battle is learning how to walk according to the Spirit. Let's look at a few verses here. Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So if you're struggling to do what's right, what do you need to do? Walk according to the Spirit. That's what it said there. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So the first thing in walking according to the Spirit is that you focus on the things of the Spirit. 
Get your life consumed at reading, getting into the Word, prayer, fasting, everything, and focus your entire life on the things of God. Because that will make the Spirit more powerful, won't it? Romans 8, 13. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So there's a dying to the flesh here. Are you going to have to give up some things to follow God? Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It's saying if you want to act like a son of God, you've got to walk according to the Spirit. Let the Spirit be in control of you. Galatians 5, 16. Thus I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So do you see the victory, if God's doing this all through you, has to come through the Spirit. And if you think you're going to just be you and walk in the flesh and do your thing like you always have uh, before you got saved, and well, you'll go to church and do a few things, guess what? You remain a baby Christian. You'll never grow. The Spirit of God will not take over your life. You will not be transformed from the inside out. Galatians 5.18 That if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. What is the law talking about? It's talking about doing stuff in your own strength. See, if the law says don't do that and I try in my own strength not to do it, how well is that going to work? To a certain degree, but you're going to eventually fail. The devil's going to out, outlast you. But the Bible is saying here, no, if you listen to what God's saying, God's going to tell you what to do, and if you obey him, how is it going to turn out? Well, what's the result going to be? If you walk in the Spirit, if you want the fruit of the Spirit, that's how you get the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Would you like to have those things in your life? Would you like to have victory over the flesh? Would you like to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? See, what is that? Those are the characteristics of Jesus. If you want the characteristics of Jesus, you have to get to the place that you're focused on the spiritual things, you learn how to hear from God, do what He tells you, rely on Him instead of relying on yourself, and find the last step of walking in the Spirit is simply saying, God, I'm out of here. I want you to live your life through me. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live. In the life I now live, I live by the power of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the goal. The goal is to eliminate you and have the Spirit take total control over you, and you live and you walk by the Spirit in the Spirit's power, you listen to what the Spirit tells you to do, you get up in the morning and you say, God, whatever you want today, all I want is what you want. And you let Him to do it. Let me ask you a question. Which one of you can live the life of Christ the best? You trying real hard to be a good Christian, or Christ being himself, living through you. You've got to decide. But that's what God's looking for. And that's what walking according to the Spirit is. And you have to learn it experientially. In fact, I remember when my wife used to drive across Denver. She would pray to God and say, show me which route to take. And she was using that to help her learn to hear from God and make sure she was really hearing from God as to which route to drive across Denver that had less traffic jams. But you're going to have to do this, and you have to get a hold of it. If you want to go on in God, if you want to operate in the Spirit and in the power of the Spirit, and how important would that be to your counseling? See, what if you can get up every day instead of being concerned what you're going to do with your counselors, uh, people, what you're going to do with your clients, you simply say, God, today I give it to you. I'm giving you, you give me the words, you give me the wisdom, you give me the direction of what you want me to do to deal with these, these people I'm counseling. I give you all the glory and the honor and the praise and the adoration in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you've given us so many spiritual insights and so much power and so much goodness and such a powerful relationship with you. 
Lord God, and you've even brought us in covenant with you, Lord God, that everything you have is ours and you want to live your life through us. And I ask you would help us, Lord, to yield to you, to trust in you, to have faith in you, that you might take control of our lives and we might learn how to walk according to these principles and according to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>